Well, good morning, everyone. I'm back to do another raw, unedited video on uh, fear and fearlessness work. And this morning, the topic is uh, looking, it's a follow up to my last uh, uh, video on ethical practices of fearology. So, this is for um, focusing on the reference of ethical practice. Um, I call them ethical references for simplicity. And I want to start with a really simple notion of what a fearologist does, and then I'll move into the ethics. So the most simple notion of when I started graduate school, and even before graduate school in 2000, um, my PhD, I started going through the library at UBC, where I was attending a uh, you know, PhD in education. And I just started going through the books. Um, so this is the weird thing that virologists might want to do because I'm interested in collecting as much data as I can on how humans speak about fear and collectively and historically across disciplines. And as I've said in the other video, virology is really a transdisciplinary study of the relationship of fear and life. So go to a library if you want to look up what are the archival records of how humans have talked about fear so again you can see it's kind of like an archaeology or a genealogy of our speaking our discourses throughout history on fear so i would just literally go to the bookshelf grab one out i might be in a section called anthropology and away i go i start pulling books off so i'm not looking at titles of books necessarily at all i'm just actually pulling them off one my book. i want to see what in anthropology what kind of discourses have taken place? And if fear is used in the index, or I see it in the table of contents, that's all I would scan really quick. If it's not there, I put the book back and away I go down the shelf. I mean, I've done probably 10,000 plus of books in various disciplines where I would just do a section of the library. And of course, I'm taking notes and uh, collecting quotes. Um, I'm kind of a maniac that way. But I did that for a couple of years, solid, as well as, you know, whenever I go into a bookstore, I look at books that might interest me and I look for what if they might be saying on fear. And of course, I'm taking quotes, which bookstore people don't really particularly like that you do. They'd rather you buy the book. So you have to be an inveterate researcher at some level. Of course, that's my style of being a fearologist. So collected that data and that started to get me to a point where I started not seeing new quotes and that's a very interesting place to get because you know after a while you'll find you know oh that's a little bit different idea about fear or that is and that is and then all of a sudden at some point you start going these are all repetitive now i'm not seeing anything new or very rarely would i see something new and i went okay i'm starting to get a good feel of humans discourse on fear and of course if there is a word like fearlessness or without fear in the index uh, i would also search out those and collect those quotes those are much rarer so that's just a bit of research of what i did and haven't done some much so much of that anymore because uh, basically i found that okay now i kind of know what humanity has been kind of doing and how they understand fear and how they talk about it and write about it teach about it and then i said okay well now i can spin off and maybe do something new you know i, I didn't want to just repeat what other people are doing um, I look at that, but so that's really what I've spun off uh, since, you know, at least 1989, I was starting to do that. But uh, after my graduate school, I really pretty much knew where I wanted to go more and more. What I re really came to realize is that, okay, I'm studying fear because I'm interested in it. I'm interested in fearlessness as an ethical referent. So how can fear be a major part of our way we make ethical decisions as a species? And of course, as a virology, as a study, a specialized study of fear. All right, so that's that little bit of background. And now I wanna go into what I've come up with over the years of what are called fear responses. And I'm gonna just show you this because I wanna show you how I, I stick fearlessness and even fearless, which is really, I'm gonna talk more about today in this short video, is how fearlessness fits in the, the whole scheme of knowledge of 
how people talk about fear generally. And I'm not talking about specialists who talk about fear from various disciplines. Okay, so <clears throat> the typical response or definition to fear and the way we've talked about it, especially in psychology, biology, neurobiology, medicine, and so on, psychiatry, and ma many other fields, it seems like we're really caught in this a notion that we think we know what fear is and we're going to call it this and that's going to, what it's going to be. It starts with uh, fear responses could be identified, that is classified as flight, fight, behavior. So we have the choice of flight when in fear, fight in fear, more aggression, and then another one would show up once in a while in the literature, freeze. Um, so species also freeze. So you can see a lot of this came from animal studies as well as humans. And so we had flight, fight, freeze. And then along came much later, uh, those, so those were really the common ones, came along later was uh, tend and befriend. And this was feminist researchers in psychology. Thank you very much for doing that work. And they came up and said, well, you know, actually, if you start watching how women uh, across, again, different uh, historical cultural backgrounds in their studies, um, they tend to not just do flight or fight or freeze. Um, and what we re began to realize, they realized critically, um, a lot of those studies were done by men on men and and others, but done by men. And so men were looking for very particular ways to understand fear. Great. So they had a real nice critical uh, feminist standpoint or womanist standpoint uh, in how they approached and understood fear. And they said, tend and befriend that people actually, women particularly, easily gather and collect and, and support each other as a fear response, both individually and collectively. Um, women seek out companionship immediately. And so this became uh, a new addition to this you know, uh, fear responses uh, classification. And of course, it's not very well known. It's starting to become known. Uh, Stephen uh, Porges work on uh, polyvagal theory uh, out of neurobiology and psychology is, is somewhat, again, along that line, um, starting to understand how species respond, especially humans, as a social species to fear. Okay, so then I came along and uh, not too many years ago began to say, well, I think there's another response beyond tend and befriend, and I added that as fearlessness. And so that's kind of a fourth or fifth, res fifth response. And then even beyond that, in my work with uh, Four Arrows, Don Trent Jacobs, um, in a book I just wrote with, on, called Fearless Engagement of Fear at Four Arrows, I added fearless engagement or just fearless as a, a fifth response. So sixth response. So, I mean, the list may grow. I don't know if it will or not, but I've come down to, to see at least six uh, fear responses compared to especially the flight and fight, uh, which is the most popular. Okay, so there's a way fearlessness fits in. And in that list, as you move down, right? Flight, fight, freeze, tend and befriend. When we get to that level, it starts to become more an ethical, um, moral concern. Uh, you can hear it, it's, it's got to do with care. Fearlessness, even more of an ethical reference. Fearless is what I see as the most rigorous and challenging ethical referent. So I'll get to that. All right, so those are the six uh, responses that uh, I've come up with to fear as fear response. We'd have a very different vocabulary, a very different way of being educated if we understood that our responses to fear are not just based on flight and fight. Then all those symptoms and you know um, symptomatology of your heart rate increases, your blood pressure goes up, so people are basically, we've been taught, and here's my thesis, uh, we've been taught to pay attention to fear symptoms. And that's how we actually classify 
understand, identify, and relate ourselves to fear. So we build a fear identity, is a concept that I've used, around paying attention to fear and its symptoms. And that's because we haven't had this six or seven levels of depth <clears throat> of something to pay attention to. And I'm just sort of, in simple terms, saying, what if we paid attention to fearlessness? And so when fear appears, so does fearlessness potentially. In spirit, I say it does appear. It arises immediately as a self-regulating system um, to fear-based patterns. And so if we paid attention to fearlessness, we'd, all, we'd start to become very clever and very intelligent and, and respond very differently to fear. And we'd understand our relationship, our identity to fear very differently than all the, those first three levels or even those first four. So fearlessness kind of starts going uh, all the way down to fearless. What if we paid attention to fearless as a response to fear? Okay, so that's my spectrum idea. That spectrum follows a, an evolutionary of consciousness theory. I use Ken Wilber's work, particularly in the integral theory, to follow that evolutionary development. So I think a spectrum of fear responses is a, is a spectrum of fear management, education, uh, in what I talked about in the last video. All right, and I use also what I call a philosophy of fearism. Uh, or a philosophy of fearlessness. These are two concepts if you want to look up fearism, philosophy of fearism, Deshu is Suba's work, uh, and my own philosophy of fearlessness. And we've kind of joined forces, him and I. <clears throat> him and I, um, Hong Kong, a Nepalese writer and philosopher. So those um, philosophies help articulate Notice the fear responses all the way down to end and refrain, and then all of a sudden we start putting the word fear. I do, and I think Desh agrees with this. Uh, I start putting fear in front of the terms of ethical reference, right? Fearlessness, fearless. So the ethical reference for how to respond to fear best, which is how to respond to life best. See the fearologist? The relationship of life and fear. So now we have a spectrum as a theoretical, philosophical tool. I'm not going into all the data that supports this or arguments. Uh, that's a much larger video. I have that in one of my writing. Desh Suba has that in some of his writings, so you can look that up. Um, so I think the last part of this is that, you know, there are many ethical references out there that a fearologist can draw upon. Uh, the reference of healthy, that's an ethical reference. So what is healthy? Uh, enlightenment, what is enlightened? What is love? What is freedom, sanity, sustainability? Those are all ethical reference. Uh, some people are trying to bring into the language discourse of hum human beings and our societies, and they have to then be defined. So how do you define that? Well, I'm saying I, as a philosophy of fearism or a philosophy of fearlessness, we ought to keep fear in the referent, right? So it's not just reference of sustainability. I'm interested in the reference of fearlessness and sustainability. How does fearlessness play a role in that? Or sanity or health, uh, love, etc. <clears throat> okay, so fearless uh, is what I want to move to in the last part of the video here. Fearless itself to me is not a simple term. It's, it's one unfortunately that uh, in popular culture and many literatures uh, is used very loosely, very sloppily, in my opinion, and tends to just be, oh, you know, let's be fearless, let's have fearless leadership, let's have fearless schools. There's so many books and articles, you'll start to see the word fearless being used in marketing. It's become a, a signature for marketing. You know, it's an extreme. However, fearless in this spectrum, which I've talked about, which I use a very careful language and a very careful classification system, uh, I'm, I'm wanting to, us to understand fearless at a, its, its quote, highest potential, which is really a non-dual consciousness. Um, again, an evolutionary spectrum with depth and non-dual is pretty high level of consciousness uh, where we're no longer operating on a fear-based structure. Fearlessness, one above that fearless on the spectrum, is also um, no longer operating, you know, 
more than 50% fear-based in operations. And then, you know, as you go back up that spectrum, more or less more fear is still operating as the driver, uh, the motivator. So again, that fear also becomes toxic. And that's a larger conversation because of the culture of fear as a context for how fear is working, being produced, reproduced, and consumed uh, in modern societies. And I think one could argue even quite a ways back <clears throat> to the beginning of culture itself, particularly in agricultural societies forward. So we're looking at 10,000 plus years of fear creeping in to be a dominating force. And again, there's literature and support for that. If you uh, want to look at that and if you want to email me or contact me through the internet, I'll be glad to fill you in on some of those tracks for making those kinds of claims that I've just made. So fearless, I started with how do I study fear? How do we study fear um, from a fearless standpoint? And I go and notice it. With the, the feminists used a fearless standpoint was a term they used to understand and how to analyze life. And uh, particularly the tend and befriend was uh, focused on the fear response, which was pretty cool, pretty different, uh, pretty radical. And I'm going a little bit probably more radical in uh, I'm going to write to fearless. How would a, a non-dual perspective, a fearlessness perspective, um, which is really you know holistic, integral, plus, into the non-dual realm of consciousness, um, how would that non-dual, that fearless standpoint theory, which is how I define it, add to and provide? So it adds to the spectrum, but it also provides a kind of end point, right? The non-dual, I'm not saying it's the only end. We might evolve beyond that, but I can't imagine that right now. So how does that endpoint of a fearless standpoint, you know, free, quote, free from a fear-based way of knowing, understanding, acting ethically, how can we use that fearless standpoint? In fact, anybody almost could draw on that standpoint if I articulate that standpoint. So, uh, so that's what I'm trying to do in my work is articulate how we could actually utilize that standpoint as a kind of imaginary because most of us are not operating in non-dual consciousness or a stage of non-dual consciousness. It's very rare on the planet. Uh, a few sages and mystics and um, perhaps a few others may operate on that because they're highly disciplined in their consciousness development to hold that space, hold that world space of analysis and how to be in the world. <clears throat> well, most of us are not gonna be there, so the fearologist is just basically asking the question, but can we articulate a fearless standpoint theory that helps explain and helps articulate a reference point ethically of how to then analyze the rest of the world in how we respond to fear, how we manage fear? And that will ultimately come down to how do we conceptualize fear? Well, in this video, I'm not going to go into the fearless standpoint. That's a whole other video, and it's, it requires a lot of work and writing and thinking to actually develop, and I'm not saying I've got it down. Uh, I've been articulating it for probably 20 years plus, but, but not as a focus, and I'm starting to think more and more. Uh, fearless is a really important ethical standpoint to um, educate more and more of us who are interested to especially fearologists because of the specialty um, so that we can utilize that as a reference point for understanding what we do. Yeah, I, I think that uh, makes a, uh, wraps up kind of what I wanted to focus on, give you a sense of something beyond ethical practices to include ethical reference on fearology. Thanks for this today.